This is Beyond the Big Screen Podcast with your host, Steve Guerra. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Big Screen Podcast, where we talk about great movies and stories so great they should be movies. Find show notes, links to subscribe, and leave Apple Podcast reviews by going to our website, beyondthebigscreen.com. And now, let's go beyond the big screen. I want to welcome Louis Sarkozy, author of the upcoming book, Napoleon's Library, The Emperor, His Books and Their Influence on the Napoleonic Era, to talk about the life and times of Napoleon and discuss it through the discuss Napoleon through the lens of the 2023 Ridley Scott movie Napoleon. So, um, Louis, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and how you got particularly interested in Napoleon? Sure. So I'm a, I'm an author uh, rather than a historian. Um, I have a history degree as a bachelor's, but I don't practice uh, history as a profession. I'm not a professional historian. Uh, and I wrote this book uh, mainly because for the past four or five years, I've been completely obsessed with the life and times of Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, not something I studied in school. It's more of a personal interest. At least that's how it started until I started writing about it more seriously. And I first got into it uh, by reading the 2015 or is it 2014 biography of Napoleon by uh, the British historian Andrew Roberts. And before then, I had schooling in France, of course, although most of my education took place in the United States. And I knew the story of Napoleon. Uh, every French kid knows the story of Napoleon. In fact, most people know at least some aspects of the story. But I had never really understood what his life and his achievements actually meant. And it, until I was about, you know, 17, 18 years old, I stumbled upon that biography and it was, it was a slap in the face. Um, I, it was a, it's a 900 or a thousand page book, uh, wonderfully written. I mean, it's the definitive, uh, one volume biography of his life, in my opinion. And I've now read quite a lot of them uh, by a British historian, no less. And, uh, it's incredibly sympathetic to him and to his achievements. And it really portrays the incredible polyvalence of the character. I mean, he, he was a man, I mean, people know him today because he was a great military uh, genius and he certainly was, but that is one aspect of who he was or what he did. He was a great reformer. He was a great lover of the arts, a great connoisseur of tragedy and of theater, a great reader, as I try to highlight um, in my book. He was a, a man of fascinating charisma. He captivated an entire generation. I mean, it, really, I mean, people who served him dinner once, you know, wrote memoirs about meeting him. I mean, he had this electrifying charisma um, and, and touched so many different realms, uh, both uh, within the military realm, but also the political one. I mean, this is a man who took power after the most traumatic period in French history. I mean, 10 years of revolution, counter-revolution. And you, here you have this 30-something year, 30-year-old guy, and maybe 10, 15 of his advisors completely reform and create what is today modern France. So it, it was a period which uh, I knew about, but truly I knew very little about. I Like people t today, you know, there's such a lack of intellectual ambition, I find, in some of my contemporaries. They, oh, yes, I know. I know the story of Napoleon, but there's no understanding. And, and it's upon reading the Roberts biography that I first had my glimpse of understanding and it completely unlocked the gate for me. And I, I fell into the rabbit hole and, and still I'm not out of it. Uh, although the book... It, is an attempt to, to sort of get him out of my system after six or seven years of, of being a little, a little too obsessive, at least in my wife's opinion. Now you are, you're from France, so you have the perspective of a French person. And we get so much uh, in the Anglosphere that we get a very specific view of Napoleon that's, I would have to imagine, in contrast to what is the standard French perspective on Napoleon, what might be the thumbnail sketch of what the average French person would think about Napoleon? Well, my answer to your question, and it, it's a great question, uh, is is uh, different than what it would have been maybe even five or 10 years ago, had you asked me five or 10 years ago. Uh, today, um, it's either you get this, uh, let's call it the historical uh, reaction, which is, oh yeah, great man, great leader. Uh, you know, yeah, he won the Battle of Austerlitz, right? It, it made the code Napoleon. That's pretty much the extent of it. But over the last five, 10 years, um, you have this whole new segment of the population that views them through the prism of social justice. And, and now, and we saw this very clearly, um, two years ago, three years ago now, 
during the anniversary of the bicentennial of his death. Uh, the, the, the sphere, as they call it, the, the media, um, both social and um, sort of news channels and newspapers, constantly hovered around his supposed racism, his supposed sexual, uh, sexism, his supposed colonialism. Uh, so now you're just as likely to find somebody who's like, oh, yeah, you know, horrible, colonialist, sexist, racist. Uh, you know, we, we shouldn't uh, we should take his name out of pretty much everything. Uh, so I would say that that's pretty much the two archetypes uh, that you would find now. Of course, uh, and I'd be happy to talk about it if this interests you. He absolutely was not a racist nor a sexist. Uh, and even the, the, the accusation of colonialism must be taken um, with a pinch of salt. Uh, granted, most of his conquests were over white Europeans. Um, so it, another interesting facet of, of the story. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that's the two archetypes you're, you're likely to get. In the Anglosphere, uh, and my book is being published um, in the UK, uh, will be also published in the United States, but it's, it's a UK-best company, uh, Pen & Sword, uh, available for pre-order on their website, by the way. Uh, in the Anglosphere, especially in England, um, you have uh, sort of the yeah archetype, uh, the, the stereotypical enemy of England. So that's how they know them, the great uh, duo with Wellington. But there's also a great Napoleonic um, readership in England. People really like him. Uh, in fact, it's probably the most developed Napoleonic readership outside of France is England, which is ironic because this is the, the great enemy uh, that did so much to destroy everything he stood for, uh, everything he built. So uh, it, it's interesting. The Anglosphere, uh, and I think this 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 likeness of him, this enjoyment of his and his story has, has translated to the US. We, you have people in the United States and England who have Napoleonic libraries, who buy every book that's published by Napoleon. It's part of why it's quite easy, actually, to, to write a book about Napoleon, uh, because every historical publisher will tell you, yeah, that sells. Uh, so he still fascinates uh, to this day. In fact, there's been more books written about him than any other figure in world history. I mean, more than Jesus, more than Julius Caesar, more than Alexander, more than Mohammed, uh, more than anybody. I mean, I, I think the count is um, there's been about a book and a half published on him every day since his death in 1821, which rounds up to, to about 300,000 books. Uh, so this is a, a surreal number of texts uh, written about him because the guy's an enigma and it's, it's an amazing story. I think that's what you get to is that he has probably the most incredible rise, fall, rise and fall again story of anyone in history. And just to put all my cards on the table. I thought this was one of truly the worst movies I've ever seen in my life. And a, a big part of it was that it really did seem to miss that. It it didn't seem, it, and at least in my opinion, it missed that arc of his story completely, the excitement of it. And also we could delve into a little bit. I think that as far as a piece of storytelling, just in general, it just... In, in acting and basically in every quality that I I would look for in a movie, it it completely missed. What were your maybe overall views of the movie, having watched it at your maybe once or a couple of times? What did you think? Yeah, I've seen it twice, and I've seen it with much different audiences, which uh, I found was a an interesting contrast. I, I've seen the premiere in Paris, organized by the Napoleon Foundation, the Fondation Napoleon, house packed with you know, 600 aficionados and historians, and it was followed by talk, et cetera. So highly expert audience and French audience. And I also saw it in, uh, you know, a, a rural remote theater in North Carolina uh, with my wife, who doesn't uh, much care about this stuff, and like a couple buddies who are not historians, et cetera. So completely different setting. And I got both reactions pretty much the same from, from the crowd. Everybody was disappointed. Uh, I heard some people like the movie, but purely as a, you know, a piece of entertainment. But at least from what I got in my own personal circles, everybody was disappointed. Yeah, I should probably warn your listeners. So I, as I've said before, I, I got to this theater with a whole lot of anticipation and eagerness. Um, I, my bar was set high. I, I've been arguing for um, a sort of large scale, long a biopic or historical epic to be made on him forever. I mean, this guy's story, as you rightfully point out, is bewildering. I mean, it's like it is, it, everything you think it is multiplied by five or six. I mean, it, it's the most epic, romantic, uh, tragic, horrible, cruel story uh, probably in human history. I mean, this is the, the rise and fall, the, the massive cavalry charges, the romances, the infidelity. I mean, the thing is a script. It, it, like if you were to write a script of this guy's life and give it to somebody who had never heard of him, they'd read it. They'd be like, OK, yeah, it's amazing, clearly, but a bit too unrealistic. Don't you think it's a bit too much? I mean, this is this it's bewildering. I mean, this guy who comes from nothing, conquers Europe and then loses everything because it's not just the rise, as, as you said, he loses everything to the point where he's exiled and can't even see his son on a 
remote South Atlantic Island. I mean, the whole thing is so tragic. So I, I get to the theater with all this, with 10 years of saying, some, we need a big budget. We need a big director to make a movie about this guy. So my bar was set pretty high. I thought it was dreadful. Uh, I thought it was a horrible, horrible movie. But, uh, and I'll caution your listeners again, not because it's historically inaccurate. Ridley Scott has quite rightfully said, don't get your history from Hollywood. He's 100% right about that. Uh, in fact, many other historical movies, including by Ridley Scott, were completely historically inaccurate. And I thought, wonderful movies. I hold Kingdom of Heaven in a class of its own as a movie about the uh, Kingdom of Jerusalem and the Crusades in the Middle Ages. I I'd love to hear your opinion. Personally, I thought it was a masterpiece. I mean, the the everything from the music to the casting, the battle scenes, the colors, uh, the dialogue, the subtlety, the the profundity. Um, I mean, you you have dialogue like it's not you know Muslim bad, Christian good, or Christian uh, b bad, Muslim good. I mean, everything is subtlety. Everything is is a gray area, just like history is. I mean, that's what there rarely is there a good guy and a bad guy. I mean, everything has to be understood from perspective. And everything has to be approached with humility. I thought Kingdom of Heaven did that wonderfully. There are seven or eight characters in Kingdom of Heaven that Scott plays with. Every single one of them. It's beautiful to, to watch evolve through the movie. They, they sort of balance each other out, both on the Muslim side and on the Christian side. Uh, and I just thought it was a profoundly deep, moving, beautiful picture. Again, you talk to historians of the crusade or historians of the kingdom of Jerusalem, this every, there's something wrong in every scene, but that does not matter. I thought Napoleon was bad because it's bad, not because it's historically inaccurate. Yeah, to your point about the kingdom of heaven, if you can get past, if you're not such a fan of history that you can't get past the inaccuracies it is it's the colors are rich it's and that he plays with the colors when the scenes are supposed to be in the depressing village that the uh, protagonist starts off it's very dreary and when he moves to the holy land it's bright and everything and you don't get any of that in napoleon there's no play with anything of there's no whimsy in it whatsoever it's just from pretty much dull color to dull color to dull acting to just it's just dull dull really wooden dialogue throughout the whole thing that's one of the things that i was going to add that i would love to hear your opinion on is that napoleon and really josephine as well it's a uh, it's almost like they have a, a rod up their back. The whole, the whole story that it's the most stilted dialogue. And I mean, not as someone who doesn't know a lot of the details or much in the way of details at all, but I do know the broad strokes that they had a fiery relationship. And would you say any of that comes across in the film? Nothing at all. And uh, I mean, you put your finger right on it, especially with Napoleon. Napoleon was a Corsican. He was, a, and, and the Southern Mediterranean people back then as today were fiery, emotional. And him was extraordinarily fiery and emotional and electric. I mean, every time somebody met him, you felt this sort of relentless energy bubbling under the surface that it could be unleashed at any moment. His anger was legendary. Legendary. At a meeting, uh, I think in 1813 or, or a little earlier with Metternich, you know, he throws his hat on the ground and stomps on it like a child. He, he breaks tea glasses. Um, he, he, his anger when, uh, with Talleyrand, uh, on one occasion, the great diplomat, I mean, he threatens to punch. He, he goes up to him with the, with the, 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 the hand clinched, ready to strike him. I mean, it's berating him for an hour. I mean, this is somebody who wore his emotions on his sleeve. When he, when he met somebody new he, he, and he was interested in them, he would go up to them and immediately barrage them with a million questions. I mean, he would do this with chemists during dinners. You know, he, he would go up to them and ask about that chemical reaction with that compound. And he would go to mathematicians and ask about that equation and what have they done with that equation? And since when I've been doing mathematics and are they married and do that? I mean, just, just overwhelming people with questions. None, and, and, and none of that is in the movie. I mean, it, it, um, Phoenix plays him. As if this is a northern Frenchman from Lille on a winter, uh, you know, holiday in Sweden. I mean, this, it's the coldest, least Mediterranean portrayal. I don't think he smiles. I, he smiles one time, I think, that I remember in the movie. And, and he, you know, he, he cries in his handkerchief twice as sort of pathetic emotionality. Um, he's portrayed as an idiot, um, as somebody who's completely uncultured. Uh, Phoenix manages to portray him as a brute. 
who strikes Josephine at the divorce ceremonies, completely absurd, but who hits her, and yet uh, a emotional. So he, he struck all the wrong chords when it comes to, to Napoleon. Josephine, I thought, was better played. Uh, I, I, and I thought that, uh, I forget the actress's name, sorry. Um, maybe you'll can get back to me in a couple of minutes, but I thought the woman who played Josephine uh, was the revelation of the movie. I, I, th- I don't think she was that known prior. Uh, I think she'll be very well known after. Uh, she, I thought she played very well. Um, but still, I mean, uh, their interplay and their romance, I thought was vulgar. Uh, we, we have like six sex scenes and, and, and what purpose they serve. I'm not exactly sure that one gets more vulgar than the next. Uh, I mean, at, at some point she raises his skirt, her skirt and, and say, so, you know, look down here, you know, general. And you know, I mean, this is all, I mean, I, I, I fail to see how this adds to the plot or to the romance or to the, to the quality. But yeah, of course, you, you're completely right. Uh, Phoenix, uh, in fact, himself said that when he got on set, he didn't know how to play the man. That very little research had been done by him. I mean, to me, to hear that from a, you know, such a legendary actor on a $180 million production with uh, Ridley Scott produce, I, I, this is bewildering to me. I mean, h- how could you not do some, some research? I mean, this is insane. Steve here with a quick word from our sponsors. That is interesting. That comes right across that he didn't really know anything about Napoleon. And it wasn't I was discussing this with a friend of mine and he was like, oh, sometimes that's how Joaquin Phoenix will play a character. But it didn't strike me as that was direction. That struck me as somebody who didn't know who he was. He had no study. He didn't know who the person was. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, It strikes me in the in the same way. Uh, and, uh, and I'll also, I, I, to go back on the color for one second, um, they put this, this filter over every scene. Everything is gray, Bl- this bluish gray. One of the major aspects of, of warfare in that period is that the uniforms were in constant competition with one of one another as to who was more colorful, who was more sublime, who was more well-dressed. I mean, this is a, a period of warfare that is completely alien to our current day and age in warfare where camouflage and, and efficacy is, is, is the new religion of the uniforms. Back then it was, um, you know, who is more resplendent, who is more beautiful. I mean, the, the Polish lancers with their purple and gold, um, you had the Empress Dragoons with the, the leopard skin on the, on the golden or brass helmets. I mean, this was wonderful uniforms. And in the movie, everything is great. I mean, I don't know if these directors think that just because, you know, this scene takes place before 1800, Color has disappeared from the world for some uh, bizarre reason. But this was a wonderfully colorful period. Uh, and, and nearly all sources who saw battles at this day and age um, testify to the, to, the, to the colorful nature of the engagements. It's one of the first things they talk about. It's the glint of the bayonets and the, and the colors of the uniform. I thought they were not that uh, impressive at all in the movie. Everything was gray. Uh, although I did see that apparently Napoleon was nominated for Best Costumes yesterday, uh, which for such a large production with such a storied director and such a legendary actor um, is sort of an insult uh, to just be nominated for, for the costumes. I could be wrong. Maybe they were nominated for something else, but my understanding is that that was the only thing. That's one of the things that seemed to me as a hallmark of Ridley Scott is huge scenes. Like if you think of uh, uh, Kingdom of Heaven is one, they'll show the battles and it's just sweeping and you get the whole scope of it. And I never really got that in this movie. I think one of the closest one was the burning of Moscow. And even then, it really was just focused on a few buildings. You didn't get this, or, uh, especially in this time of warfare, where there's tens and hundreds of thousands of soldiers on the battlefield. And you get maybe one or two glimpses of that, just that scope. I it, That was one thing that I don't think he captured at all in this movie was just the grand scope of these battles. I couldn't agree more. The, the scene in Kingdom of Heaven, when uh, the Battle of Karak, that never takes place, but the, the, the two armies wind up in front of Karak, and the Muslims get there first. Um, and suddenly, in, in the back, you know, almost without announcement, you see emerging from the dusty horizon the um, relic of the Sacred Cross, followed by the entire crusading uh, Jerusalem army, is one of the best scenes, in my opinion, that I've ever seen. I mean, the music, the all of them marching the uniforms, even if they're inaccurate. Who cares? I mean, that's art. What an epic scene. What a beautiful moment. What it perfectly encapsulates the clash of civilization, which was the Crusades. Uh, all the Muslim banners on one side and all the Christian banners on the other. 
Um, and the battles in Napoleon, I thought, didn't even match the ankle of, of that scene. I mean, I'm also reminded of Gladiator, the other of Ridley Scott's Napoleonic epic. The first scene of Gladiator is wonderful. It, you have the, uh, you have, um, uh, the, the, the main actor of Gladiator, I forget his name, Maximus, who is on the battlefield, uh, you know, peering into the devastation of the field and the dead bodies. Uh, and then suddenly he, his eye catches on to a little bird on a branch. Uh, and, and his attention is diverted from the horrors of war to the little red bird. And then the bird flies away and you see him sort of peer off into the distance and then he loses the bird and he, his attention is brought back to the, to the horrors of the battlefield. I thought there was more depth to that 30 second opening than the entire Napoleon movie. Because that's Roman Stoicism, right? I mean, that, that's, that, that, that's it's such a perfectly Roman opening to a great movie, also filled with inaccuracies. But that opening, I thought, really struck a deep chord. And I've, I've got some, some Roman historians, who, who, uh, friends of mine, who, who agree with me here. I mean, this opening was, was really, really well thought out. Nothing like that in Napoleon. The battle scenes, much anticipated in Napoleon, I thought, not great at all. Um, of course, absolutely no um, connection to the real battles. I mean, Austerlitz is portrayed as a vulgar ambush. Uh, the, the fighting in Austerlitz is just is is like something you'd see in in the TV show Vikings, uh, as Thierry Lenz has pointed out. I mean, you just have this mob charging. Uh, you don't understand anything that's going on. Um, Waterloo is in trenches. They're fighting in trenches, as if Scott confused 1815 with 1915. Uh, 100 years too early for, for trenches, I'm afraid, in Belgium. Um, and you have these cavalry charges, which to me, I mean, if, if you're a director, the cavalry charge is the most epic moment of the production. I mean, it, we have sources that tell us that the, when, when they were witnessing cavalry charges, soldiers died of heart attacks because the sight was so awful, so terrifying. I mean, you're talking about thousands of people on large, well-bred uh, war horses, sometimes armed with metal armor and broad sabers, charging shoulder to shoulder, first at a walk, then a trot, then a gallop. The earth shook for miles. People miles away knew that there was something going on. I mean, this is an epic thing to stage and produce. And I thought they were, in the movie, a complete disappointment. The, the second greatest cavalry charge in history is widely regarded as the Battle of Eilau, when the, the, the frontal charge by Murat uh, temporarily broke the Russian lines and allowed the rescue of a part of Napoleon's army and almost saved the battle, uh, in a way. Uh, the, the, it, it's, it's, I think, 10,000 horsemen, uh, shoulder to shoulder in a big column charging together, uh, according to the latest estimates. Um, the battle's not even portrayed in the movie. I mean, if you're making a biopic about Napoleon, perhaps, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a director or a producer, but perhaps the second greatest cavalry charge in human history features somewhere. I mean, I, I don't think this is such an unreasonable opinion. Uh, and I thought, yeah, Borodino, it, it, you get like a shot of six horses running around in a field. Uh, you get a charge in Waterloo. It's like a single line of horsemen. I don't understand why directors consistently fail to understand the mechanics of cavalry charges. I mean, it's not that, un that complicated to understand. And if you do it well, it's bewildering uh, to see. I mean, it, it, why does Mr. Scott believe that his take of a, of a cavalry charge is more sensible and more reasonable and more logical than the actual warriors who had to depend on them for their survival. Perhaps we listen to the actual warriors who fought and died and planned these things uh, rather than the interpretation of a, a 2020 um, Hollywood screenwriter. Perhaps he knows a little less about cavalry charges than the sources tell us. Speaking of that, that they, all these different battles that they portray and they even skip major battles, what did you think of the scope that they pretty much start from the beginning of his career and go all the way to the end? Was that just way too aggressive to take on over 20 years of a person's life and try and jam it? Even the, the movie was pretty long. It was close to three hours, but that's still a lot of lifetime uh, to encapsulate in such a short amount of time. Indeed. I, I, when I first saw the trailer, oh gosh, a year, two years ago, maybe I forget when it came out. It's the first thing I said. I said oh, wow. Okay. So you got two and a half hours for 20 years. And to go back on what we were er saying earlier, this is not just any 20 years. These are some of the most densely packed 20 years in human history. I mean, within that scope of time, you get more history in France than some nations see in five centuries. I mean, truly. And I, and I weigh my words when I say them. 
you know, revolution after counter revolution, seven wars, seven wars of the coalition, a, a collapse, a resurgence, another collapse. I mean, this is just some of the most densely packed events and most consequential events in world history. I don't think it's undoable, but I do think that was a failed attempt. Uh, it's, a, it's very ambitious, but you know, sometimes projects with large ambition come out to be absolute triumphs. Uh, I thought there they didn't strike the right chord at all. The, the first time I saw the movie, it's the first thing I said, everything goes way too fast. You, you, they spent, and I timed, five minutes in Egypt, something like six minutes in Russia. Uh, the second time I saw the movie, I was with a buddy of mine. Uh, we were watching, I forget exactly when he, uh, when he walked out. Oh, no, I remember. Okay, so he, he, he gets a call right when uh, the Russian invasion begins. Right? It, it's not explained why he goes there, but okay, he goes to Russia. He gets a call, he walks out, comes back like four, five, six minutes later. He's like, what did I miss? It's like, well, you missed the Russian invasion. You missed the birth uh, of his son and his second marriage. You, you missed the abdication. Uh, and I was thinking of coming back. He's like, I was, I was out. Five, I, the whole thing flies by. I, and nobody, if you're not intimately familiar with the Napoleonic story, you're lost. You're like, wait, wait, why is he in Russia? Why is he in, in Egypt? Uh, what, what's going and they still manage, despite going so fast, to miss huge moments of, of the Napoleonic story. The Battle of Marengo, the, the, the two Italian campaigns don't even exist. And the, the reason why he became Napoleon are the two Italian campaigns. They don't exist. Okay, fine. The farewell to the guard, probably the most emotional moment of the whole 20 years, uh, when he says bye to his elite corps of uh, infantry, uh, the old guard, which had been with him. Uh, you know, for, for 20 odd years, uh, and after the collapse and the first abdication, he, he, he bids farewell to them. He kisses their flag. It's a legendary moment uh, of the Napoleonic story, not even featured. Uh, so I, I, and, and, and nothing about the isolation and depression and, and growing a disease of his life on St. Helena, the ultimate, uh, closing of the story. Uh, such a tragic six years that he spends on the island where, you know, depression, slowly creeps in and disease slowly creeps in and he just progressively, uh, you know, uh, unable to read even at the end more than a page, uh, let alone a paragraph. I mean, nothing. I mean, he, 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 he loses. He is all cheery. He gets to St. Helena. He has, you know, a meal and just and collapses from the chair and it's over. I, I just, yeah, I, if it, I think it is possible to portray 20 years in three hours or so. Uh, I don't think that was a particularly good attempt. I wonder what you thought of this scene. I thought it was the one scene where you maybe got some tiny glimpse of the character is when Napoleon's on the ship and he's eating and the midshipmen are around him. That seemed to be the only scene where he's got some sort of life out of him, that he would be the type of person. Otherwise, if you didn't know anything about Napoleon, you'd be like, why are those kids hanging around him? But obviously... Anybody who would be able who would be able to get within a couple of feet of Napoleon would want to hear everything that he had to say. You're completely right. Uh, electric attraction and charisma, uh, not portrayed in the movie, but at least that scene sort of hints that the real guy had it. Uh, and it's also true that uh, during the passage to Saint Helena on the Northumberland HMS Northumberland, uh, he grew incredibly friendly with the English sailors. Uh, he discovered with delight all the British propaganda that had uh, been made uh, throughout his reign and that was prevalent on English ships. And he completely charmed uh, many of the sailors and officers. We have their testimonies, we have their memoirs, we have their stories. Um, and in fact, everybody on the ship when they uh, disembarked uh, was completely enamored with him. And this was uh, completely typical. I mean, even people who hated him could not deny that he had some bizarre attraction. Uh, and, and he, he was all awkward with women throughout his entire life, for example, but still had something like 24 mistresses. Uh, and even women who despised him, uh, you know, couldn't deny uh, the, the, the attraction. So yeah, that scene absolutely hinted at it. Of course, that scene is immediately followed by him meeting the Duke of Wellington, which never happened. Uh, and by the way, I also thought the Duke of Wellington was horribly portrayed uh, in that movie. He looks sort of old, senile, goofy, vulgar. Awkward, um, not at all what, what Arthur Wellesley really was. Uh, I thought, uh, and I don't know if you saw this movie, but the, I think it's 1970 production of Waterloo or 1977 with Rob Steiger as Napoleon. Not a fan, but much better than Phoenix, but Christopher Plummer as Wellington. Christopher Plummer as Wellington is a triumph. Oh my God. It, it, this is the closest we're going to get to meeting Wellington is Christopher Plummer. I mean, barring the invention of a time machine. 
what we got is Christopher Plummer. And it's a, it's a damn good, imp- oh my God, that was good acting. He was perfect. He was the in- funny, sophisticated, highly aristocratic uh, Englishman th- that, that he was. I mean, it, it was a wonderful portrayal uh, of Weddington. That was one of the things that I was going to bring up is the Duke of Wellington. They portrayed him. He was stiff. He was I got the sense that at least in the battle scenes that they were almost portraying him as a god of war, that he came down from the heavens to orchestrate this battle and destroy Napoleon, sort of giving away the whole plot. And it reminded me of the I think it's from 1994 Gettysburg, the movie in a lot of ways, this movie remind and length that was pretty close to Gettysburg, but it was trying to maybe be that way that the the characters were almost otherworldly. But it just it seemed to I didn't love that aspect of Gettysburg, but this movie completely failed in that attempt. And that's one of the people that's immediately I thought they could have picked up that Wellington and placed him into the Gettysburg movie and he would have fit perfectly. Yeah, I agree. And uh, and our conversation here highlights uh, what I consider to be one of the major problems with the movie is that barring Napoleon and Josephine, there is no real secondary character. Uh, Barras is features prominent, but he, he's a placeholder. I mean, he, he tells Napoleon to do stuff, but he, he, he's almost he's completely pushed around by events. He, he, no, and we, nobody takes him really seriously when you watch the movie. Uh, Talleyrand is inexistent. You know, the I did the podcast of a friend of mine, um, the literary salon, the salon littéraire, a couple couple of weeks ago, and um, he said something which is completely true and and is highlighted by any historian of the period. Napoleon was fascinating, trailblazer, extraordinary. Yes, of course, but in France at that time, you also have a golden generation, and and, and my friend said, you know, Napoleon is a star, but around him there are planets, and this is. Absolutely true. Both in the political and the military realm, you have geniuses which arise. I mean, in the late uh, 18th century in France, people like Roderer, people like Talleyrand, people like Barras. I mean, fascinating characters, Murat, Ney, uh, Soult, uh, Davout. I mean, these people were just incredible. And they all sort of appear on the scene at the same time. It's a bit like the American Revolution when you have the Jefferson and the Washington and the Adams, all, all, all these geniuses appearing at the same time. And in the movie, there's none of that. Talleyrand doesn't exist. You see him twice. Uh, he suggests making himself king, making Napoleon king. You don't really know why. And then he, he, he betrays him, but you don't see the betrayal. And then he sits at the Congress of Vienna and you don't know what, what he's doing there. Uh, Barras, as I said, is a complete placeholder. The, the most amazing cavalry military figure, apart from Napoleon of the time, was probably Murat. Not in a sheer a military genius, that would have been Davout, who was uh, probably the greatest uh, tactician, uh, barring Napoleon of the time. But Murat had a class, a charisma, a panache, which was incredible. He was a cavalry general, cavalry marshal. He led cavalry charges in person, always dressed in the most extravagant, chic, resplendent, and flamboyant costumes. Um, during the retreat from Russia, it's negative 40 degrees Celsius. People are dying everywhere. In fact, something like 60% of the army is already dead or missing or gone or deserted. It's the complete, a complete disaster. People have no shoes. There's no food. They're being harassed on all sides by Russian armies and Cossacks. Everybody's trying to get the hell out of Russia by cro- crossing the, the Berezina River, which was supposed to be frozen with that temperature. But of course, it's the ultimate Murphy's Law. You know, everything that could go wrong does go wrong. It's not frozen for some reason, despite it being negative 40 degrees Celsius. And yet Murat has a wonderful white shirt with the color open and a plume and a red scarf. And, and he's still, you know, uh, triumphant on the battlefield, even in defeat. He inspired so much admiration and respect from the Cossacks, the enemy cavalry, that the Cossacks, when they got near him, would scream his name in, in, in honor to venerate him and uh, try to capture him alive. Because they were so like, imagine that parallel today. Like that, that would be like uh, Taliban soldiers or, or Islamic State soldiers in Iraq or Syria and Afghanistan being so fascinated and respectful and enamored with an American soldier that they would scream his name. They would look out for him. They would try to capture him. It's unthinkable. I mean, that, that would, this, it's weirder than fiction. And yet it happened. Murat's not even in the movie. <laughs> like this, this, it's unthinkable to, to not have Murat in the movie. I mean, Mary Napoleon's sister was king of Naples. I mean, this is, uh, I don't understand whether absolutely no research was done beyond Napoleon or Josephine, 
whether they deemed that it was simply not worth the cut. But how can you give Barras, you know, have this scream time that, that you gave him and not give Murat or Talleyrand the, the, their fair share? I mean, complete lack of, of secondary character. Yeah, I, I have to agree wholeheartedly with that. And really, the I think when you get down to it, it was a romance movie with a couple of battle scenes. Very, very well put. Uh, yeah, it was a romance movie. And listen, that's an interesting angle. You can do that. You, you can make a romance movie by Napoleon Josephine. It is, it, that is just fine. It is a perfectly good angle. God knows how many thousands of books have been written from that angle. But then don't sell it as a biopic. Don't do the whole life then. Then do, truly do, the Napoleonic Josephine romance and the ups and downs. First of all, it cuts out half the story that you no longer have to cover. After the divorce, it gives you more time to focus on your angle. But I, I feel like that was their original idea. And then they kept saying, yeah, but we have to add this. But then we have to add this. Then yeah. And so instead, we have a, a patchwork of events that don't seem particularly well connected. You have a mosaic of things that they wanted to cram in and, and cram in. And uh, it, it, the whole thing doesn't make uh, too much sense. I also want to, want to piggyback on a thing you said at the beginning of our conversation that I thought was, was spot on. The writing of the dialogues was particularly bad. I mean, and, and this is this is my opinion, of course, but I brought my wife, who, as I said, is, doesn't particularly care about this stuff historically, and some of my buddies who are interested, but again, not really their, their, their wheelhouse. And they, they, it, that's the things they, they both told me as soon as you got it. It's such bad writing. It's cringy. It's shallow. There's never a hint of something deeper. There's never any subtlety. I mean, there's this scene, I don't know if you remember it, when they're all eating dinner. And in, in, in the Palais des Tuileries, uh, I believe. And Josephine and Napoleon start fighting. And, uh, and, and he's like, when are you going to make me a child? And, and she responds, you know, you have grown fat. And he, and he says, it's true. I like my meals. Destiny has given me this lamb chop. I was like, is this, is, they wrote this? <laughs> somebody, like, it, it had to happen. They were in a room planning the script. And somebody wrote, destiny has gifted me this lamb chop. And they're like, that sounds great. Let's put that in, in the movie. Destiny has given me this lamb chop. We, the, the greatest man in, in world history, $180 million budget, storied actor, legendary director. And we get, quote, destiny has brought me this lamb chop. I mean, I, is this satire? Is, uh, is Scott going to come out and say it was a whole joke? You know, I was just messing with all of you. Like, I, I, is this, it's impossible. I mean, how could this, how could this happen? <laughs> The guy who was, you know, the, the most well-read monarch in human history, uh, the, you know, who impressed Goethe, the greatest German philosopher of all time with his knowledge, who would go up to mathematicians and musicians and chemists and impress them with his knowledge of their disciplines, who was a critique of theater and tragedy. Destiny has brought me this lamb chop. I mean, I thought that was, that was the, the, the triumph of mediocrity of that movie. Steve here again with a quick word from our sponsors. That really was one of the worst scenes of the entire movie. It just as a, as a plot device, it's like, what is this doing? I mean, I guess it's to say that Josephine can't make him a heir. And it's like, what is this scene trying to get us? And I think that that was probably one of the problems of the movie was just that pacing where they're spending an inordinate amount of time on these discussions that go nowhere and then it blasts through russia like you said in six minutes i was wondering uh, it's something that you had brought up in our pre-conversation was even though it was only again maybe about four minutes was the invasion of egypt by the french and I, we get one of those themes that uh ridley scott brought up and say the the movie he did about the crusades this colonialism what was the this whole campaign in Egypt about, and could it just be boiled down to colonialism? Ab absolutely not. As always, uh, it is incredibly more subtle, incredibly more complicated, and incredibly more interesting than modern political commentators will let you know. So the, the logic behind the Egyptian expedition is relatively straightforward. It's, I would say, twofold. Uh, the wars in Europe have sort of died down for France. They won some victories in Italy, some victories in Germany. So Austria, Prussia, Russia are sort of calm at the moment. England is still at war. And of course, you cannot invade England if you're France, because the English have the most powerful navy in the world, the Royal Navy, and you simply cannot invade. You can't cross the channel, despite it being a relatively short body of water. 
because the Royal Navy would decimate you. So there's another idea that, that is sprung up, and that is to disrupt English trade with India, the prized colonial possession, and the East more generally, and to supplement that with French trade, especially in the Eastern Mediterranean. So they want to invade Egypt, create a sort of French colony there, administer it as a French colony, and also, by the way, conquer the small island of Malta, which is south of Italy and north of Egypt, to create a, a permanent French naval presence in Eastern Mediterranean to weaken uh, the English presence in the Eastern Mediterranean, to weaken the power of English merchants, and uh, by de facto the English economy, and replace them with French merchants. And if possible, and that, that is according to Napoleon, if, you, if, if what I just described is, is successful, perhaps you can think about pressuring the Ottomans into a more lasting, uh, lasting uh, alliance by having an army on their frontier, perhaps marching onto India, although this was never really realistic, but to, to threaten the English there, they were terrified of this. Um, so that, I would say that, that is the strategic reason. Also, from the point of view of the directory, which is the French government at the time, you have this young general who just won stunning victories in Italy, who's incredibly popular. And this is a time when coup d'etats were very, very common. So everybody in power sort of is afraid of Napoleon. And they're like, oh, perfect. Let's send him away. Get him out of the country. Uh, and if he goes to Egypt and succeeds, we have a wonderful colony now. Uh, and England is weakened as a result. And if he fails, his reputation will be sufficiently tarnished and he will be less of a threat to us. So that, that is the three minute pit. Of course, it's, we can go on for years about this. And, and in fact, years have been devoted by researchers and books have been solely on this topic, but that's generally the, the lay of the land. So they, they, he goes with, um, at that time, uh, the largest army to ever sail the Mediterranean. Uh, and it's about, I think, 30 or 35,000 soldiers, 13,000 Marines, um, you know, hundreds of ships and transports goes on to conquer Egypt. But. And this is where, you know, this story gets even more amazing. And again, the movie doesn't even touch about this. Napoleon doesn't just bring soldiers and Marines and sailors. He decides to bring hundreds of uh, antiquarians, historians, botanists, biologists, sculptors, architects, engineers, cartographers, balloonists, the people we call the savants. Uh, the, it's, it's, calling them scientists is a bit... Um, dishonest because we still didn't have the modern sciences we have today, but this is very much just a precursor, just before the emergence of sort of highly expertized scientific disciplines we have today. So 200 of the greatest thinkers in Europe and in France, because he does, he, he's fascinated with history, Napoleon. He reads avidly, as I, as I try to point out in my book. Uh, and he's a huge fan of Alexander the Great, who famously, uh, and this is very well portrayed in, in the book Napoleon Loved, Plutarch's Lives, uh, brought 200 philosophers to Egypt with him when he conquered Egypt uh, to study and decipher um, that country. And Napoleon is very much in the same vein that he brings along the savant. And so all along this story, you have the military aspects and the colonial aspects of the venture. But in parallel, you have an incredible intellectual and scientific aspect which follows along. So what do these savants do? They create the Institute of Egypt. They install the first printing press in the history of the African continent. The papers they publish there and print will be the first papers printed in the history of the African continent. Their discoveries will eventually lead to the uh, deciphering of the hieroglyphs, hence unlocking almost all of, of Bronze Age Egyptian history and, and much more. They create modern Egyptology, and they probably create or at least have a huge uh, hand in creating modern archaeology. So th their discoveries over there, I mean, they collect thousands of specimens of bugs, of beetles, of, of, um, of animals. I mean, they, they study soils. They, they study how to make bread with local ingredients, how to make beer. They study old manuscripts. They decipher old uh, inscriptions. They dig up temples. They make maps. They study if it's possible to make a Suez Canal 70 years before the Suez Canal was made. I mean, they, they completely unlock the country, which was a black box. I mean, nothing was known uh, even by most Egyptians of the time. Uh, they, there simply was just no interest and no capacity to delve into the country's past or the country's battle. You had some amazing philosophers and thinkers, of course, the heirs of the great Islamic traditions of philosophy. Uh, and, and we have some of their uh, testimonies. And I go into pretty big depth in my book about their testimonies about the French. But you just have this amazing intellectual venture. And 
uh, it's not at all an, an ethno ethnic uh, one. I mean, the, 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 the French army and the savants constantly invite the Muslims and Muslim scholars to come see experiments. They invite them to visit the libraries. Uh, in fact, were you and I to walk in the library of the Institute of Egypt uh, in 1797 or 1798, uh, we would find soldiers reading about ancient history, would find Egyptians completely welcome to come and consult the maps or consult books. Uh, you would find experiments, electrical experiments, which uh, amazed the, the locals, uh, attended by uh, Egyptian students. So you, you ha- it's not at all a, an ethnic uh, exclusionary uh, venture. It's a tremendously open one. Now, uh, don't let me tell you and don't believe me if I do, that this is purely out of the goodness of Napoleon's heart. Uh, this was absolutely a sort of pes- um, a sort of realistically colonialist venture as well. Why? Because he wanted to woo the locals. He wanted to impress them. He wanted to, I mean, this is probably the world's first hearts and minds campaign. He wants to seduce the locals into accepting French rule. As history tells us, this was not particularly successful. But anyway, this, this is, this is the, the story of the Egyptian expedition. It's an amazing military venture, amazing foreign relations experiment. Uh, when it comes to all, uh, you know, uh, so, uh, changing the, the balance of power in, in Europe and the Eastern Mediterranean, but also an amazing intellectual, cultural, poetic, artistic venture. Uh, and and uh, none of that is portrayed in the movie. Uh, I mean, it, they spent five minutes in Egypt. He opens up a mummy, he looks at him, and, 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 and then you know, he learns Josephine's cheating on him, so he, he leaves. None of that is, is reality. Uh, it might w- well just have been better to, to not portray uh, the Egypt at all, rather than do it such a, a grave injustice. It, it almost, it's almost like Scott, w- w- the movie is, is really a triumph of um, the still shots. So it, you watch the trailer and you're like, oh my God, this is epic. I mean, the, the shot of the pyramids, the, 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 the shot of him walking into Russia. I mean, these scenes, were you to press pause? Like that's a painting. That's a beautiful scene. But as soon as you play the movie, you realize that's all they are. They're, they're just scenes. Uh, and, and I mean that in the, the rudest possible terms. You just have the image and, and no story behind it. You don't understand what's going on. And then he moves on to, to something else. Yeah, I have to agree 100 percent. That epicness that the trailer promised did not come through in the movie. And I'm wondering, there hasn't been like you were saying earlier in the conversation is that you were hoping for this to be the real epic treatment of Napoleon in the English language that there really hasn't been. Is there a maybe a treatment of Napoleon in the French film industry that's come across that maybe gets something closer to what you were looking for? Not to the well, let me say this. There's another English one which is not particularly well known, but I thought was wonderful to, to look. It's a rather small budget, French production, uh, came out in 2003, 2004. It's a TV show. I believe it's seven or eight episodes. Uh, it's called Napoleon. It, Napoleon is played by Christian Clavier, a great French actor that I'm afraid your American audience will not know, but uh, us Frenchmen uh, and Frenchwomen certainly do. Uh, and Talleyrand is played by John Markovich. Uh, and John Malkovich is a wonderful Talleyrand. I mean, he, he is very, very, very convincing. Um, Fouché is played by Gérard Depardieu. I mean, this is it. Josephine is also incredibly convincing in that in that uh, TV show. I thought that was the best uh, probably I've ever seen. Other uh, productions focus on one aspect of Napoleon. So, for example, Waterloo with Rob Steiger and Christopher Plummer, just a Waterloo campaign or the, in the battle. Uh, wonderful movie. And really, I, I love the movie. Uh, doesn't come near to trying to encompass the 20 years of Napoleon's life. There's also a French movie called Mr. N, Monsieur N. And that is about, uh, it's complete fiction, no basis in reality, but it's about uh, Napoleon's alleged escape from St. Helena and resettlement in the United States. Uh, no, no basis in reality, complete fiction, wonderful movie, wonderful movie. Another proof that um, uh, you don't have to be perfectly historically accurate to be a great movie. Uh, it's a it's a French production, as I said. It's relatively low budget. Uh, I don't think the movie exists in English. I think you'll find uh, a version with subtitles. But I, I highly encourage your your listeners to um, to watch it. It's it's very very well made. I often ask somebody, "How do you think you would fix it?" And after having spoken to you, I think the one way you could fix this is it has to be a an entire series. And I think of a, it's a French production, if I'm not mistaken, of uh, about Alexander the Sixth, the Borgia. Uh, 
And it wasn't very historically accurate, but it captured something of his life. And I think that that is the thing that this movie just tremendously failed at is it captured nothing of this great man's life. Like we don't, even if it's completely historically inaccurate, we don't get who Napoleon is. If you could fix it, how might you present Napoleon so that we can really understand a little bit about this man? Well, I think you're right. It has to be a TV show. Uh, and when I say this, people say, oh, yo, you know, people don't care that much. They'll lose interest. Uh, you know, people don't read. I, I, I disagree. I mean, we, we see shows that go on for 27 seasons with a devoted viewership. Uh, I fail to see why if suddenly you were to make a TV show that's somewhat based on reality, you would immediately lose the interest of the people. No, you wouldn't. You just have to make a good show. Uh, and if you were to make one with Napoleon, you're particularly helped because this is the most amazing story ever, right? It, like, as, as we said, I mean, a tragic, horrible, gory, uh, beautiful, romantic. Uh, I mean, you got everything. In, in that. So I think you would have to make a TV show. Uh, I think you would have to just devote time. Uh, you, you would have to make the first season about his youth, probably starting at the same point. Uh, when Ridley Scott started, or, or probably a little earlier, when you you so you, the beginnings of the legend is him as a teenager, you know, who, who reads all day history and dreams that he's going to become a great man like Caesar and Alexander, and then you go through step by step, and you you have a very convincing cast, you have a large budget, you have wonderful uniforms. I don't see why it couldn't have worked. I mean, we Vikings uh, triumphed on on the little screen. Um, and it's, it's somewhat a historical, but I mean, based obviously on historical events, uh, and it goes on for God knows how many seasons and it's perfectly successful. So I, I would do a TV show. Uh, I would most definitely do a TV show and I would just make something. I think audiences respect when there's subtlety and respect when there's some profundity, some depth to dialogues and scenes. Um, I, I at least I, I'm convinced of it. Maybe it's the optimist in me speaking, but I, I don't think people are idiots at all. I think. If you give them something with some intellectual standing, they'll appreciate it. And I think the greatest shows to have ever come out always had some level of intellectual uh, standing. It, not make a dry academic treatise, but make something where you don't take your audience for idiots. I feel like that's what Scott did a little bit. He, he said, well, we can do something that's historically inaccurate because people will just immediately tune out. Well, no, I mean, th there's a reason why, uh, you know, uh, Andrew Roberts' biography is sold, you know, God know hundreds of thousands of books. I mean, people watch and listen and read. I mean, the age of the podcast, as you exemplify, people tune in to two, three, four hour podcasts listening uh, on history, astrophysics, biology, philosophy, theology. There's a great intellectual hunger. And I fail to see why that intellectual hunger cannot be married to some great Hollywood production. I mean, it can. You just need the right cocktail. I think that really leads us up to my last question for the day is, how do you convince maybe somebody who isn't that interested in history to make them understand that Napoleon's important today? Well, uh, am I convincing him that he's important or am I convincing him to like read a book or watch a TV show or something? I would say to get him to the next step, to read a book about it, to maybe your upcoming book. Well, to, to, I have to admit, uh, if I were to tell somebody who's never heard of the man to read any book, I don't think I would recommend mine first. But although you, you absolutely should read my book, and it's, a, I hope, a, a good one and an honest attempt, uh, because I, my angle is a little different. As you mentioned, I, I, I try to look at him intimately rather than the great legend of the warrior and the reformer. I, I want to see what he was like when he's alone at night reading. And I think, you know, this famous phrase, you know, give me the library and I'll give you the man. And I think there's many facets of Napoleon's character that you can find uh, through his readings and through his, what he said about his readings that you don't find when you watch the battles or listen to the political propaganda or what you usually hear in the legend. So you, you absolutely can read my book uh, first if you've never read anything about him. But if you're still interested, then you probably should do a, a fully fledged biography. What I would say is very simple. This is the most awesome story probably in human history. I mean, it's just, it's just incredibly cool. All right. I mean, this guy who comes from nothing, I mean, he's the ultimate self-made man. He comes not exactly from nothing, but uh, come on. I mean, it, it, impoverished nobility in a backwater, that's Corsica, conquers Europe through an enormous amount of luck and an enormous amount of genius. 
uh, you have the most stunning battles, the most stunning foreign adventures uh, in every setting. I mean, literally at the at the feet of the pyramids in the arid, fr- frozen Russian steppe, battles on the high seas when you have massive men of war, ships of the line that explode. I mean, this is just the ev- this is every young guy's dream. I mean, the, these battles, I mean, this is what ever, at least what I thought about when I was 12, 13, you know, it's big ships with big guns and, and people charging each other with horses. But also for our female audiences, you have some of the most amazing romances uh, ever. Um, for our political audience, you have some of the most amazing political reforms ever. For our legal audiences, you have the great harmonization of all the, the divergent legal texts of France into a single coherent text that remains today 50% of all of our laws. And that was copied by virtually every country in the world. Uh, if, if you're obsessed with music, you, 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 the, the period produced some great musical masterpieces. He himself was a great musical uh, aficionado. If you like philosophy or literature, he, he, he remained such a figure in literature that came after him. I mean, he, he was seared into the minds of European writers and philosophers after him. Chateaubriand, famously, who hated him, by the way, who despised him. They were in great conflict. But after his fall said, what the hell are we going to talk about now? I mean, he, he was everything. He, 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 he was all of the qualities and all of the bad things in a human being into one. He did everything, all the mistakes, all the accomplishments. He, he, we, he, Chateaubriand says we are condemned to perpetual boredom after him. Everything will be boring. boring. What are we going to talk about? So that you, everybody has something in the pony, especially the young people. I mean, this is not a story that is fit for, you know, 87 year old, you know, history professors. I mean, this is the guy was 26, you know, 27 general in chief of the army of Italy, 30 year old. He governed France as first consul, reformed all the laws, created all the institutions. Um, Andrew Roberts calls him the enlightenment on horseback. You know, I like to think of him as this sort of tornado that sweeps through. He captivates an entire generation and sort of disappears like a shooting star. And falls from power and then dies. Dies relatively young. Uh, so it's really the story of the shooting star. He, 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 he rose faster. He shone brighter. And he disappeared harder uh, and more tragically than probably anybody else. So everybody's got something to find in, in his story. Every, every single person. 